He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Power on. Parent. Connected. New Zealanders love road trips. That thrill of the open road and the anticipation of a picturesque location to relax and unwind. Sitting shotgun beside you is your teenage daughter wearing a lovely summer dress. And when you're almost at your destination, she pipes up and says, So, I think I'm transgender. <laughs> okay, it wasn't that dramatic. And the good news is mum didn't crash, but you get the point. Kia ora, I'm Joseph Stockhausen. And this is a podcast where I take you on the journey that both my mum and I have travelled after I first came out as transgender. We'll be meeting all the people who helped us along the way, as well as other parents who are on the same journey. So if you're a friend, family or whānau member, or just interested in this whole trans thing, then this guide is yours. If you're at that place of freaking out because your child has just come out to you and you're rapidly declining into a spiral of Google searches, just pause the screen tapping and listen. It's still me, nothing's changed. Just little parts of me are rearranged. I'm still here, so are you. We've got so much growing left to do. This is more than just a kid and a parent. Let's be transparent. Kia ora, I'm Joseph Stockhausen, and welcome to the second episode of Let's Be Transparent. This episode, I want to share with you some of the practicality of coming out as trans. For everyone involved, there's a lot to unravel, and what to do and where to go can seem really unclear. Life is in transition in so many ways. The mix of questions and emotions can be really confusing, so it's time to have a chat with some of the people who are there to support both your young person and family at this stage. Hey, Ma. Ma. Yeah? Could you give me a ride into the city? Ooh, are we going to do our car chat? What? No, that's at, that's at the end of the podcast. I need to record the chats with the people before that. God. Okay, keep your skirt on. Or not. Oh no, did I say that wrong? It's fine, I know what you mean. Alright then, come on, I'll see you in the car. I'm in central Auckland. Just off K Road at Rainbow Use Drop-In Centre. Kia ora and happy birthday to Rainbow Youth, our uh, longest standing LGBTIQ youth organisation in the country and obviously uh, operating since 1989. Rainbow Youth is a prominent organisation that provides support services and resources for both young people and their whānau. They have a free wardrobe that helps young people beginning this process to feel more comfortable in their appearance. Classic, Joe. Out of one closet and straight into another one. Ari Jansen is a transgender support worker here at Rainbow Youth. He works with both young people and their parents who are starting out their social transition. One of the strong feelings that comes up during this time is something we call gender dysphoria. Put simply, it's the discomfort or the distress a person feels when they don't feel at home in their assigned sex. It was just like an ick, like a, just a, a gross feeling. It's something parents often struggle to understand as a concept, as well as the feelings that go along with it. Ari's got pretty good at helping parents learn to relate. When your body or your relationship to your body or other people's relationship to your body completely doesn't align with your sense of yourself. Mm. Um, So I said once to her dad, like, well, how would you feel if you just suddenly developed breasts? Like... Would you be okay with that or would you want them gone? Because like for a lot of trans men, or like at least in my experience, that's kind of how it felt. It was like, what the heck is this? <laughs> like I this does not belong to me. Like yeah. this is not right. Dysphoria for sure happens in someone's head. But it isn't a mental health condition. How Ari described it as an ick earlier was a good example. He knows that for a parent this is a whirlwind. What being trans means for a kid at school, in a sports team, and even just at the dinner table. But before any of those big scary leaps, 
there are smaller steps you can take. Is there a, a type of jumper or, you know, a pair of socks that make you feel really good? <laughs> that when, yeah. you, when you look down and you see those socks, you're like, that's right, that's who I am. <laughs> yeah, um, socks with moustaches on them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, why not? Um, I think with uh, transgender things, people immediately go to, like, permanent medical solutions and yeah. while those can be really affirming and wonderful for a lot of people there are so many other things that you can do to alleviate gender dysphoria in the meantime um and it can be like doing this kind of activity together like what if i teach you how to how to put on lipstick would you want to do that there are small affirming steps you can take as a supporter a haircut a pair of shoes even a new star wars bedspread can let them know you're trying Your young person isn't always going to have all of the answers, but you can start talking to them about how their future can look and feel, how they want their future to look and feel. Something that I've started to do with some young people is to just like draw a little picture and be like, who do you want to be? How do you want your life to be? What, what What do we need to wait for, but what can we change right now? The opposite of gender dysphoria. It's just gender euphoria. While things can make you feel bad, there are other things that you can do to make you feel great. Um, And some of those things that we've named that eliminate dysphoria can give people gender euphoria, which is just an amazing to be be seen and to feel right is, is incredible. Ari just mentioned an example of passing. This is when people see you as the gender you identify as in public. It can be pretty rough on a person when they're not passing and get misgendered. Heck, I even changed my name because of it. If you're there and see their discomfort, try introducing them of their preferred name and pronouns. You never know, it might actually help you out as well. But don't worry, we're all humans who make mistakes, and this is the one time that participation award actually counts. And I think, like, friends and families can do create those environments for you. And also to reassure you that while you are not comfortable with your body, you are not your body. Like, you are who you say you are and who you feel you are. And therefore, I will call you that. And I will do those things that make you feel good because I believe you and I am going to reshape my view of you to fit your view of you. You told me that you're a man. I am going to begin to think of you as a man. You told me that you're a woman. I'm going to begin to think of you as a woman. Mm -hmm. Because you are important to me. Because I love you. Because I know that that's what's going to make you happy and thrive as a person. You can create those moments of gender euphoria for someone. While there are small, everyday items that can help a person's gender dysphoria, there are some specifically designed items that can really bump up their gender affirmation. There is no official name for them, so I'm calling them gender affirming accessories. Ari's gonna show me a few of them from the closet I was talking about earlier. It's starting to feel like a scene from New Zealand's Next Top Model. Who will be New Zealand's Next Top Model? So we have a few things here. Um, We have, what's it called? Booty shapewear. So this is like, kind of like some, you know, underwear basically. Yeah. And you probably put it under your underwear. Or you could probably just wear it by itself because it pretty much just looks like underwear. Um, but yeah, it's got some, some extra padding in, in the butt area to make it look and feel like you have maybe like a more feminine or more pronounced bum. Shape. Yeah. Mm. And yeah, it's, it's very, very harmless. And like, in fact, this is not exclusive to being transgender. There's cis women, women who might want to wear something like this to make them feel more confident. Um, or feel more confident in different clothing and stuff like that. If you're curious to see what these look like, then take a look at our webpage, transparentpodcast.nz. Another thing, similarly, uh, what are they called? Breast pads, adhesive breast pads. Also not exclusively used by transgender people, cisgender women can use these to like maybe make a dress fit better or um, something like that. Just again, to get that more you know, feminine, shapely sort of look. 
Yeah, to, to make it look like your chest is bigger than it is, basically. Mm. Also, feel feel bigger than it is. Sometimes it's actually more about feeling than looks, and that, that counts too. Um, yeah, absolutely. This is stuff like, some people sleep in this stuff to like make them just feel really comfy or to test out how their body would feel if they were to do something more medical in terms of gender affirmation. Yeah, actually that's a really awesome sort of practice run for it as well. Totally. And if you're going to start wearing more gender affirming items in the home, then like even just putting this under loose clothing where no one can see is probably quite affirming because they can just do that in their own space. Totally, mm. yeah, and you can always, yeah, try stuff out like this. It doesn't have to be for people's perception of you. It can be for your perception of yourself and just to try things out. Have we found New Zealand's next top model? Absolutely, I believe so. Because of what they accentuate, trans feminine people may wear them so dysphoria in those areas isn't so bad. There are also items trans masculine people may wear. One is called a binder. So a binder compresses your chest area. It's like it can, it's like a tank top that's quite tight, and it has a a kind of shelf inside. This is a secondhand one, so um, you know it's not in perfect nick. But um, this kind of shelf restricts or compresses your chest. Um, and then there's a layer of stretchy kind of swimming tog material on top. Um, yeah, so basically if you put a binder on and it's the right one and it fits well, in theory, you put a t-shirt or a top over that and it gives you the appearance of a, of a flat chest or, or a cis male chest. When you're trying out a binder, probably just try it for a few hours at a time at home so that if you do start to feel uh, like your breathing is restricted or you're experiencing physical pain, you can safely take it off um, in a place that's comfortable for you. But that said, if your binder is the right size and you are you know, not experiencing those kind of difficulties, your binder should be safe and you should be good to go. After that, you can wear it for up to eight hours at a time. Um, if you do experience any discomfort, give yourself little breaks, go into the bathroom, take it off, do a few stretches, do some breathing. I was just thinking, like a few people I've talked to, their parents, or they've discussed together, like a kind of binder safety plan or a routine where it's like, you know, you wear the binder at school, you get home, you take your backpack off and you take your binder off, you know? And that's a safe space where um, dysphoria might not be so so difficult because you're at home and you're with people you're comfortable with. It's safe to say that looking the part is a major part in feeling comfortable in your own skin, but actually being that gender is a whole of a minefield. I've only ever known it from my perspective, so to help understand it more, I am meeting someone who is no stranger to these chaotic conversations. Tough Becky's working hard there. Slowing down minutes, but away she goes. Cooper Sides lives in Christchurch, Otatahi, but happens to be in Auckland for a roller derby tournament, a sport they're really passionate about. And Kiwi is up and away, and the crowd are loving it. If you haven't seen it before, just imagine a race on roller skates, except if people get in your way, you can push them over. It was made famous by transgender actor Elliot Page in the 2009 film Whip It. Last season champs are led by their captain, the league's leading scorer, Iron Maiden! Yeah, she's the one from the flyer. On a side note, Whip It is a great movie that examines clashing ideologies of parents and kids. I've just been thinking, I think maybe you're being a little selfish with your mom. She's the one who has been shoving her agenda down my throat since day one. Just because you found a new family doesn't mean you throw the old one away. Oof, that's highly relatable. When Cooper isn't on skates, they're a youth worker, thanks to a new initiative from the Canterbury District Health Board to help provide psychological support for young trans people. So when I tend to start working with young people, it's usually about from 14 onwards. None of the young people who I have 
um, the who I work with um, had already started hormone blockers before they started coming to see me. So a lot of them um, are already experiencing a lot of dysphoria um, and they're trying to figure out how to manage that and how to be able to access um, healthcare that will that will mean that they will experience less dysphoria and um, less distress, because that's what dysphoria is. Dysphoria is distress due to the, the gender not adding up with what their, phys uh, their physiological, um, what well, their body is. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, most of the time um, they come to me. Cooper found that when working with youth, it also means working with parents. There's a range, so I've got some young people who have basically no relationship with their parents anymore because those parents disagree with them, that they are the gender they say they are. And any time gender comes up, we'll just argue with them about it. So for them, it's not worth it to try to have a relationship with their whanau. Um, then there's the awesome awesome parents who the kids are just so grateful that their parents are like, oh, you say you're a boy? Oh, you're a boy, sweet, hey son. And just kind of treat it that way. Like they'll, they'll, they'll say something's wrong, they'll get the pronouns wrong every now and then, but what the core of it is, is that they believe their child. Yeah. So those young people um, just, they've got that great relationship. And then I, then I have that middle ground, which is the more common one which is still a relationship with parents, but there's a disconnect in that the parents don't understand the young people and, the, and what they're saying about their gender. And the young people are just getting really frustrated because the parents will say something that disregards kind of all the other things they've already said to their parents, and that kind of shuts them down and makes them not want to try to help their parents to understand them. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Cooper sees a lot of supportive parents come through the door, but that also means there are parents out there who aren't engaging in services at all. There's some parents who don't want to find out this information from organisations like Rainbow Youth or Inside Out because they have a mindset that is, are oh, these people are pushing this on my on my on my child, oh, like it's a bias. Yeah, it's a bias, which it, it yeah. is. But yeah, yeah. Um, and so so that's where it's really difficult. Um, one parent I actually did manage to um, somehow get through to, um, and that I heard um, from her that she wanted she didn't believe that her son was a young man because she kind of thought that she might have been when she was younger. And it turns out that there was other mental health stuff. So she wants every other mental health thing to be ruled out before she was willing to take on board that he could be trans. Um, and that's where getting the um, psych uh, psychological assessment for gender dysphoria came in really handy, as um, once that came through and medical, uh, sorry, mental health professionals, <laughs> psychologists had assessed that actually this kid's mentally stable, he's just trans. I'd ask the parents to be like, what, what are you worried about? Are you worried that these people are going to be able to convince your kid that they're trans? In which case, does your kid have no autonomy over who they are? And you don't think that they are able to understand who they are? Like, how often do cisgender people think that they might be trans? <laughs> you know, like... I haven't heard of it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey Joe, you've explained to them what cis means, right? Ah. Uh... The podcast people won't know what you're talking about. I mean, I didn't know what you meant when you first used the word. Ah, oh, that's a really good point, actually. So, cis is short for cisgender, and that means that you're comfortable in the body you're born in. Your gender identity and your sex are essentially the same. Um, and maybe they might think, oh, am I tra No, 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 <laughs> you know, and write it off. Um, so I, I would think that surely if a young person isn't gender diverse in some way, that they wouldn't be able to be convinced that they were. 
I can see where parents are coming from. It's unsettling if people have opinions, but no immediate backup to the facts. And finding stories of what's happening a world away on the internet can be scary. While you're scared, your kid's going to keep ageing. Your kid's going to keep living. Puberty's going to happen. I guess I ask that you don't let your fear stop you from listening to your kids about what they need. The ideal for me is that I don't have to do my job anymore because young people aren't having to experience what they need my support for. And so many of my young people say, God, I just wish that people would let me take hormone blockers before. I wish I didn't have to deal with all of this now. So please, if you're scared, if you just want to do the right thing, I know that you love your kids and you want to do the right thing, please just let them have blockers so they can figure out what they need and you can figure out what they need and what you need. Just let them put a pause in this time while you're scared and they're scared and just let them figure it out. Taking hormone blockers is a big decision and not something to be entered into on a whim. But I guess from Cooper's frontline point of view, they can see the before as well as the after when it comes to what kind of impacts they have on young people. It's a topic I'm going to unpack with medical professionals in the next episode of this podcast. When I was feeling challenged about how I was going to present as a guy, after having spent my whole life to that point as a girl, It was not only a mental challenge, but there was also the practicality of it. Never shying away from a challenge, Ma got into some more of the hands-on aspects of it all. But I'll let her tell you more about that. Ma, I'm finished. Let's go into the car. Oh, great. Fantastic. Can you just give me two minutes? Two minutes? I gave you a whole episode. I know, but I need to do my hair. Ugh, okay. this lady doing on the road? Just standing in the road. Tell me what you found in the washing machine um, when that, what, which was my first point. Like, what, what did you actually find? Well, I found that, so I was pulling your washing out. You had left it in the washing machine and I'd gone to do the washing. And um, so I was pulling it out to go put it on the, wa- uh, the clothesline. And I didn't see it at first. It wasn't until I was hanging stuff up and then I was just like, what the fuck is this? And um, actually, I didn't know what it was at first. And I think I, I was like, came to you and I was like, I think I had it inkling. I was like, oh, this is, this is a bind. This is him binding. But I wasn't 100% sure. I thought maybe it was like, you know, a school project or something. And then I asked you about it. And it was, I was kind of shocked that you had done it for yourself and then I was kind of ashamed as a parent because I hadn't taken the initiative to actually get that for you or to help you get that you know like I felt like I had failed a little bit the fact that you were doing stuff you know on your own and you couldn't talk to me about it in a way that made me really realize how important it was or made me explain to me about passing and about how, you know, and I think we did talk about it in a way because then you explained to me, you know, how your breasts made you feel. And that was a quite confronting conversation for me because, you know, I had never felt such hatred for my body. Like, I'm just like, oh yeah, this is what I've got. Oh well, let's go. Whereas you had this disgust and, you know, you were like, I think you said, can you imagine waking up every morning and looking down and just being absolutely disgusted in what you see? And I was, and then that sort of brought it home to me that, that to wake up every morning and feel like that, not to be like, oh, it's great to be alive. Let's get on with the day. And then you're sort of waking up and you're like, oh, uh, yeah, it's, this is, this is wrong. This is so wrong. Yeah, I remember. I don't. I don't remember that exact conversation, but I, I remember my reaction. Um, like any time I tried to talk about it, um, or you, or you tried to bring it up, and because I was still, tr- I was still trying to figure out if, like, credibility <laughs> or like validity for being mm. trans is something that's so like so many, so many people are insecure about because you can't. We can't. There's no like like blood test 
oh yeah you've got trans like you know it's, yeah and so it's kind of like this whole thing that you have to go through and i just i just knew it was i was trans but i didn't know who i was as a as a guy yet I mean, for a parent, it's, you know, a scary time, especially when you are walking on a line that you have never, you know, you're working, working in this space and you've never, you never knew anything about it. You don't know what the right thing to, or the wrong thing to do. And I think, I found it was quite confronting with the binder that you'd done that yourself. And I wasn't, I felt like I wasn't a part, like you'd taken our journey together and gone on the side <laughs> the side route without me and I felt you know I felt ashamed of my feelings because I think I was I was making it about me you know and what I was going through and I had to really really be conscious this is not about me this is about you and whether I feel apprehensive or scared then I just was like okay it's not about me it's about Joe um and I need to really listen to what he's telling me and be supportive no matter what. If I don't understand it, doesn't matter. Find out the information. But he knows who he is. He knows what he is. Um, and I just need to go along and be supportive. And that's where, you know, <laughs> that's where, you know, it wasn't just the binder, but then the next thing was when you explained to me about packing. Like, I was like, my mind was like, what? Like, what is packing? And um, did I you, did I tell you I was packing at that time? Um, I think how the packing conversation came because the sock fell out of your pants. <laughs> no. Wait, wait. And I was just like, you know, did we this were, happen in front of you? No, it didn't. But you told me about it that day. Uh, you're like, I got to tell you something funny. Stationary warehouse. Yes. Yeah. And I was like, hey, I don't understand. Why? What? What? You had a sock down your pants? Like, I don't, you know. So I was like, what? You know, so packing is like making sure you uh, present yeah. as a male so, downstairs. That's my, yeah. well, let's just go with my interpretation. Um but it's funny, I mean, yeah. that, that whole story, you know, and then you're telling me about packing and then, you know, telling me that you can buy silicon penises. And I was just like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> and then I was having a conversation with my mum about it, telling her, because I tell my mum everything. And she was like, well, well, this is serious, you know, we really need to, um, you know, get him what he needs. Aww. And I was really? like, okay, yep, well, Christmas is coming. <laughs> so... <laughs> Because, <laughs> you know, and um, well, I'll buy my son a penis. And here I was, three, three, two or three in the morning, and I'm on a, UK, a US website um, looking for penises. And um, it was hilarious. I was giggling because I could just, I was, it was like an out of body experience. Here I was, sitting in my bed by myself, looking at all the different penises, you know, big, small, large. Which one shall I get? And all the different colours, and then, and then you know, um, waterproof ones, and you know, and then the undies to fit it in. Oh, and, yeah. and I'm just like laughing, going, because um, you know, Mum and I were like, oh, we'll buy it for Christmas, because they're they're not the cheapest. And um, I was like, I just had this realization that no, 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 <laughs> this is so wrong. I cannot buy. I cannot be the parent that buys my son a penis. Um, I'll give you the money and you can I, go do that. But I am not going to be like, here you go, son. <laughs> it's a blue Merry one. Merry Christmas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that whole binder situation, that really made me just be more, um, no, we're changing this. Anything you need, I'm going to get, no matter. And, and, and just ignore my feelings about being scared because being scared of the unknown. Um, and I just needed to jump on board and, you know, really show you my support instead of holding you back because of my insecurities. Well, it really started us off, like, in having my transition. It's kind of like, as this is what both of us are going through, you know. Then there was the whole topic of, like, well, I, I need to change my name. And, like, what name do I go by? And um, Yeah. 
and 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 we, and we talked about that you know like potential names and you're like oh no you don't sue jamie at all you can't be a jamie i mean the reason we transitioned you to bryn was more for me because it was easier for me to go from brianna brie to bryn yeah you just take the vowels out and that's <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but Bryn, yeah. but then you struggled with the Bryn name. I love the Bryn name, but you had issues with it and then, you know, came to me and said, Mum, I just need to change my name. And I was a little sad, you yeah. know, and I was a little sad and I was a little worried that I wouldn't be able to cope with the new name because it took me so long to get sort of transitioned to Bryn. But then you changed to Joseph and it didn't... And that name seemed to just fit so nicely and it didn't actually take me long at all to sort of snap into Joe. Yeah, well, I I mean, I liked Bryn, but the thing is, is that it's it's a unisex name. Yeah. And at that time, my voice was not as deep as it is now. Um, my features were very feminine. I don't have my beard. And when I, have, when I don't have my beard, I look like a 15-year-old dude <laughs> yeah. or just, just weird. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and so I had to I had to change it because Bryn was just not working and I was yeah. I kept getting misgendered. It's one thing to experience being misgendered in your own mind, but to be on the receiving end of it from the eyes of others can be really tough. Getting the help from support services is one thing, but to get the support and unconditional love from parents or parent, well, that's everything to a young person. I honestly don't know where I'd be if I didn't have my mum there for me when she was. Coming up on the next episode of Let's Be Transparent, we're heading to see the health professionals about the physical and mental aspects of transitioning. Thanks to you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed our second episode. If you've got any questions or want more information on anything you've heard, we've put together a whole list of resources from each episode on our website, transparentpodcast.nz. A big thanks to today's guests, Ari Jansen, he, him, and Cooper Sides, they, them. Ari works for Rainbow Youth. You can find them at ry.org.nz or at Rainbow Youth on Facebook or Instagram. Cooper works for 298 Youth Health, 298youthhealth.org or at 298youthhealth on Facebook or Instagram. Let's Be Transparent is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio or wherever you find your podcasts. If you've enjoyed listening, then I'd be really grateful if you gave us a rating and leave a review. Let's Be Transparent was created and presented by me, Joseph Stockhausen, he, him, and my mum, Pauline Stockhausen, she, her. Our theme song was written and performed by Maxwell Apps, they, them. The executive producer was Tim Watkin, he, him. This podcast was produced and made by the team at Motuehe Group for Radio New Zealand. Also, huge thanks to Radio New Zealand's Liz Garten, she, her, for all of her awesome advice putting this all together. This is more than just a kid and a parent Let's be transparent